Hi, and welcome to this special evening in the Virtual Commonwealth Club program. This club is now an all virtual organization, and you can see all the club's great offerings at www.commonwealthclub.org. Uh, my name is Bucky, uh, Bucky Sinister. Uh, I was a developmental editor on uh, the book we're going to be talking about today. I live in Los Angeles, and I am happy to be here tonight with my friend Neil Pollock to discuss his new book, Pothead, about Neil's struggles with marijuana addiction at the time of legal weed. Uh, this is Neil's 11th book in his career, and Neil joins us here from his home in Austin, Texas. Hi, Neil. How are you? Hey, Bucky. I'm doing okay. I, I love that intro, how they they show all these, <laughs> these, uh, these great uh, you know, luminaries of, of, of intellectual life and entertainment, and, and then here's Neil and Bucky. Yeah, and none <laughs> of these people will be here tonight. This two other people. initiative presents these guys. This is who yeah. we could get in the pandemic, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, they have the, the, the greatest, the best, and the brightest we've had. And now, here's these other two guys. Right. Um, we'll do our best. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you have a new book. It's called yes. Pothead. Uh, and it, oh, there it is. Nah, All right. Pretty, right. Yeah, uh, and it is about your struggle with marijuana addiction. I wanted to maybe just mention some about this. Uh, you know, in the last hundred years, we've gone from like the 1930s with movies like Reefer Madness, where like we, weed was an evil devil drug, and then all the way to now, where it seems to be like the miracle cure, uh, and, and just a, it's a complete 180 shift in cultural. Uh, just the, the cultural uh, awareness of weed or like what it could be or what it could do. Um, and it seemed like you were kind of like right on the cusp of that changing when, when you were uh, writing about it in the book. Yeah. Well, I was a reporter for a publication called the cannabis, which still exists, but it's mostly an aggregation service now, but then it was like a, like a alternative cannabis newspaper published by the Denver post. And I, my friend Ricardo Baca was the editor of it. And, uh, he was in a documentary about marijuana journalism and the birth of legal weed. And I was like, I want to get in on that <laughs> because I'm like, that's the future. It's the future of right. all culture and all humanity. And I, I, you know, I did have this mindset that it was like, it was like a miracle drug that it was like yes. the key to wellness. And it was like, the key to human happiness and, and, and health. And I, you know, I was, I was fooling myself specifically specifically fooling myself but you know i in my stupor which i was uh ingesting myself into i i honestly believed that that's one of the reasons it's one of the ways i justified my habit right right uh you know this isn't i'm not doing this for fun i'm doing this for a living i'm doing this is my profession i'm a professional weed enthusiast yes no i i managed to con my way in. i mean i had to do other work on the side, not on the side, like it didn't pay that well, but I was like, but I was, I was thought, I thought like, this is a beat. I'm going to get in on it and I'm mm -hmm. going to be like on top of it. But you know, the thing is like, there's lots of good marijuana journalism being done, but those are people who are interested in doing business reporting or science reporting or medical reporting um, or social justice reporting. I was just interested in getting high. So my pieces were all like, I went to Colorado and I stayed at a <laughs> I mean, those pieces were funny. The button breakfast piece was funny, but I was like, really, I was just dabbing in some crappy apartment <laughs> up in the mountains with a bunch of weird, weird tourists from Wisconsin. You know, it wasn't and staying in some shit bedroom. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, it was barely gonzo. I was like, I'm going to go to Oregon and report on the legalization there and the opening days of freedom. And, you know, what did I do? I just went to some, some, crummy storefront and dabbed all day. And then I went to a party <laughs> and I ate these, you know, can mushroom caps stuffed with some sort of cannabis stuffing. And I ate a bunch of pastries. And then I drove downtown from there uh, an hour um, in, in a car that I had borrowed from someone. So uh, that, that was, that was real sharp. Did you have an overall goal where you're trying to be like the Hunter S Thompson of weed or, or something like that? Or are you trying to be the, 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 the like some what were your like kind of writing goals with that i'm not really hunter s thompson like i'm not i don't like guns you know <laughs> yeah yeah I'm totally not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not i don't have i'm not as 
courageous in the certain ways that he was. Oh, and of course. I'm yeah. Like, you know, I'm like, I was kind of a dad, suburban house dad type. Mm-hmm. Um, no, it was more like a, you know, wry New Yorkery talk of the town kind of approach. Not maybe not quite as dorky. You know, <laughs> like a little hipper than that, but not not. <laughs> The, the divide wasn't so great, you know, but I wasn't, you know, my, my pro style is a lot more buttoned up than, than Hunter S. Thompson's. Yeah. The other thing I, I want to bring up here is uh, the, the whole idea of, of marijuana addiction. Uh, Cause I, I remember when I was working on the book and I was telling people about it, uh, I, I would get usually like the, these very polarized responses. Uh, like, there would be one person be like, well, it's about time someone wrote about that. And then the other response was, what are you what are you talking about? How is marijuana addictive? And and those are the two. There just seemed to be not really a whole lot of middle ground on that. But uh, just feel, maybe you could uh, uh, talk about that for a minute. Like what 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 entails marijuana addiction or marijuana use disorder or whatever people like. Yeah, to call I mean it. they call it mar- I think they call it marijuana use disorder just because I feel like the people who have worked so hard and so long to legalize weed and achieve some of these criminal justice reforms and all the, the um, you know, the sort of a raft of stuff that goes along with legal pot, they don't want it being called an addictive substance because yes. that threatens to roll back all of their hard political work. So I get it, you know, and I understand, like, and I'm, I'm not anti-legalization, mind you, you know, I'm not, like I keep saying, like, I'm not getting into bed with Jeff Sessions. I'm not, you know, taking money from the private prison industry. I don't want to see the drug war continue. But I think it's important to acknowledge that it's when you're talking about marijuana, this isn't just taking a puff off a joint. We're talking like people doing dabs of like 79% THC, Mm. you know, resin and and like eating like powerful, powerful doses of 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 THC that's contained in candies and pastries and sodas and, you know, they're you know, they're like, they're just, they're like, they're, you can put a patch on, like almost like a nicotine patch and just absorbs into your skin. You know, there, there, there are lots of ways to get high way beyond mm-hmm. what I was doing. You know, I didn't really smoke weed when I was a kid or in, in college, but like in my twenties or whatever, I was just, you know, taking, smoking a joint at a party. So, so you're looking at hard drugs at a certain mm-hmm. point, you know, it's no longer, you know, wacky tobacco. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's so so um when you're you know when when you're on I, I don't know I don't know if drugs were really your thing or not, but mm-hmm. you know at a certain point it just kind of takes over and it gets yes. in your head and it becomes the point. And everything is about the drug and you can't really mm-hmm. get out of the the headspace of the drug and it it, it kind of you know, at a certain point, you feel so crappy if you're not high that you have to get high or, you know, it, it, you risk like having actual emotions or human relationships. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So anyone who's like, what are they talking about? It's not addictive. These are either people who are not addicted to it. <laughs> yes. Quite possible. You know, I, I can have a glass of wine and not be an alcoholic or an alcohol addict or whatever, mm-hmm. or there are people who aren't, don't really know what's going, who, who aren't so attuned to what's actually going on. I mean, getting high, people are not just getting stoned. They're, I mean, they're blasting themselves. And, yes. um, you know, that by the end, that's what I was doing. And so, so I, I um, it's possible to be an addict to, to uh, of this thing. It, it is not, um, you know, some sort of benign um, health food. Right. What would you say to people uh, if they're questioning <laughs> their use of maybe anyone watching right now is like, well, I, I like smoking. Like what's the difference between me liking to smoke a lot and, and being addicted? What's what would you point you know, to anything? I mean, I don't know. I mean, not again, like it doesn't just because you smoke a lot of weed doesn't necessarily mean you're a marijuana addict. I'm not, Mm -hmm. I'm not here to like, you know, point fingers at anyone or, or call foul in anyone's behavior. You know, it's like, just like there are people who can have four or five beers and not be an alcoholic, you know? Um, 
but uh, so don't get defensive. Whoever is feeling <laughs> right now, I don't. I, what you do, I, you know, I don't care. What you do with your time and your money and your and and your weed is your business. And you know, if it's not affecting your relationships and your work and you know your soul and your you know if if, if you're happy and productive and yeah. then don't worry about it. You know, in my case, it was really doing a number on my marriage and my relationship with my son and my relationship with my broader family. And it, I mean, I never like had a complete career failure or anything, but I, I feel like things could have gone better in certain respects if I'd been doing fewer drugs, less drugs, fewer drugs, fewer you, if I'd smoked fewer joints, if I'd done less drugs. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Thank you for all Because, you know, it's all in the book. I did some crazy shit while I was high. Right. Right. Do you want to share one of those uh, stories? Well, I mean, you know, there was like, this is a weird story. But like when back when I was writing, back when I was, I had like a little period, like at the beginning of my career and like early aughts where I kind of had a moment of like hipster fame where um, mm-hmm. like, I was published by this journal called McSweeney's. Well, anyone watching in San Francisco is going to know what McSweeney's is. Yeah. I was the first author who Dave Eggers published and I was like touring all over the world and like, you know, performing on these big stages with these you know, huge named writers and these bands. And I was, um, I managed to like, I put out like a album of spoken word poetry. Mm-hmm. Like they- Sure sign. Sure sign of drug yeah. and alcohol abuse. It was like released as like it was released like like you know I, I had like it was part of like a box set I did for one of my books. It was crazy shit I was doing, and the the poetry was never published in English, but it was published in Dutch. A Dutch right. publisher who thought I had seen me perform with Mc, the McSweeney's Traveling Circus at some literary festival in Amsterdam where I was baked out of my mind, um, bought my poetry and translated it into Dutch along with Mm. some of my prose. And it was like this book that was released in Holland. It was like Neil Paul was called in Dutch, Neil Pollock's undying love for the people of Holland and also Belgium. (laughs) Okay. I, 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 I don't want to go over onto my magic shelf, but I got a copy of it. And there's this, you want me to look for it? I, I don't, I'm, I'm going to leave the screen. So I can't, I, I can't see it from here, it's, but it really exists. And it's, it's and it, oh yeah. Anyway. So because of that book, I was invited by the John Adams Institute, which is an American cultural Institute in Amsterdam to be the American representative to Dutch national poetry day. So I, they flew me to Amsterdam where I was, to, I had to teach a workshop to some Dutch high school students about how to write a fable. <laughs> and, then, and then I was supposed to give a performance of my poetry that night. I taught the workshop and then after it was over, I went to a weed cafe and I, I liked to fill these bags up with vapor and then just suck the bag. <laughs> <laughs> I, prob- I probably vaped like, you know, an eighth of an ounce of weed. It's a lot of weed. Maybe yeah. maybe less. I don't know. I don't remember. And then I went to it. At the time in Amsterdam, there were these smart shops where you could buy peyote and shrooms. And I bought a, I just bought a, I just picked up a packet of pills. I didn't even know what was in them. And I just popped them. By the time I got to my performance, I was like, my head was like, yeah, I felt like it was like it was like a like water <laughs> balloon. And I this was in 2003, just as the U.S. was getting ready to attack the Middle East, um, which I a war that I thought was a very I, I was appalled by this. I hate I hated that policy. Spoke out against it constantly. I was writing satires of these. Neo- anyway, I was very against it. But I, but I had this character who was like a fake neocon who was like pretending yes. to be for it. And I got up there 
And I started speaking like in this very jingoistic term about how the United States is the greatest country in the history of the world. And if you mess with us, we're going to wipe it. I don't remember exactly what I said. And then I took a pitcher of water and I dumped it over my head. And the Iraqi representative to Dutch National Poetry Day stood up, <laughs> called me, yelled Yankee imperialist or something like that, and stormed out of the, uh, of the room. Kind of a funny story, but, you know, I got in a lot of trouble and I had to apologize and mm -hmm. I was never, I was not invited back. So that's the kind of, I, you know, there, there probably was a way to make that satirical point with a little more subtlety. Yeah. Yeah. Satire is, is really hard, especially in another language, you know, much less when you're faked out of your mind. Um, the, it wasn't what it wasn't my point of view that was the problem it was my behavior mm -hmm. and the drugs yes. influenced my behavior and it removed any sense of social norms and it got me in trouble not my not my ideas or my opinions those are fine mm -hmm. there's i still have those opinions not like they're mm -hmm. relevant anymore mm -hmm. it's like now these are those are opinions i have uh, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, it says it kind of ties in right to where we're speaking now. Uh, question is, when did you realize you had a problem? I mean, this was definitely like a definitely one story about you having a problem. But was there a specific moment, a little yes. moment of clarity or a big uh, time, like a big clear moment of like, yeah, this has got to stop. I think, you know, the story I'm going to tell. It's in the book. Yes. Right? Um, so in 2017, my mother died. Uh, very suddenly and very horribly, and I watched it happen in real time. She passed away like almost overnight in the hospital, and uh, you know I was baked when it happened, and I was baked at her funerals, and uh, then I was stoned for months and months and months after that. I, I really went into this. I, I really went into this horrible spiral where instead of grieving like a normal person, I did drugs and I gambled. Sort of. I played poker. I didn't really gamble. I was like playing. <laughs> I was playing these like free roll poker tournaments at these disgusting suburban chicken wing bars in Texas. <laughs> like it was like the low. It was like it was like the lowest le the lowest possible level on the poker rung. The worst <laughs> players in Texas, and the lowest level on the chicken wing. Circuit. It was it was bad. <laughs> the worst of both. I, I, it was it was it was a, a, I was living a pretty scummy existence and uh but that you know okay but but then simultaneously to that i'm a i know this is a san francisco event but i'm a dodger fan i can't help <laughs> I, and i'm correct in, in in that um the dodgers were having their greatest season in god knows how many years um and they were clearly cruising toward the playoffs and then as the playoffs started happening i was like they're going to the world series and so I decided that I was going to, even though I live in Austin and I probably could have just gone to a game in Houston because that's where they ended up playing, which was you know, two and a half hours from my, my, my front door. I decided to buy a ticket. I wanted to go to Dodger stadium. So I decided mm -hmm. I, 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 I cashed in some frequent flyer miles and I flew not, not myself in, in an airplane. Uh, I, mean, I was making a flying gesture there. Um, I flew to LA. And I stayed at my sister's house. She lives in the suburbs there. And I, um, I, but even though it was my dream to go to the Dodger game, really was my dream to get high and go to the World Series. Mm -hmm. And so uh, LA, <laughs> LA was just a few weeks away from full legalization, getting, you know, from their, their, their golden moment. And I'd read on the internet that there was a, some places that were already starting to serve out of town or so I went to Van Nuys and I, and it turns out, or I, I, I thought one of the dispensaries was doing it and it turns out they weren't. And so I waited outside and I, this woman, when she was done with her, her kickboxing class next door came out and I, I handed her a 20 and asked her to buy me something. And she came out with this like super thick fat pre-rolled thing that was covered in crystals, you know, like, like just crystallized crack marijuana. <laughs> Um, and then I went and played some poker for 16 hours 
uh, and then I started getting high and then I bought and, and, and then um, it got higher and then I bought a ticket on one of these third party uh, ticket sites to the World Series. I spent 900 something dollars. I put it on my credit card. I didn't feel like I really $900. Maybe I had that maybe, but it was, certainly wasn't like I didn't. I'm not a person with a lot of disposable income. And so um, I, I then I posted it on Facebook like I'm going to the World Series. It's my lifelong dream. Hey. And then some dude who I had never met messaged me. He's like, hey, man, I live like I live like a, a mile from Dodger Stadium. Why don't you come by my place? I'll smoke you up. You can park your car in front of my house, then just walk down to the game. I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So I, <laughs> so instead of like going, I, you know, I don't like to pay for parking. I never like to pay mm. for anything except for apparently for $900 for a World Series ticket. So I like... I went to this guy's house and I smoked my super joint and he had a bunch of weed and I smoked a bunch of weed and I ate a gummy bear and he told me a bunch of weird stories about, I don't I, he wasn't harmful. He was, he was, a, he was a nice guy. You know, he was, he was, uh, not, he didn't mean me any harm. The, the point isn't that I went there and he hit me over the head and stole, stole my wallet. It's that I got super high, super, super, super high. And then I walked from, from his house to Dodger Stadium. And when he says a mile in L.A., especially in 100 degree heat, can be a long way because, I don't know, you live on the east side? Over the, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I know assume, that neighborhood pretty well. I assumed you did. Um, so um, a lot of hills, a lot of ups yes. and downs. Like really steep, I mean, a mile. Cause like, it was basically like I might as well. I've climbed K2, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I was, and by the time I got to the stadium, I was like sweaty and dehydrated, bring a baseball cap and a Dodger shirt. And I'm like, I had this long, bushy, almost white beard. And I was big. <laughs> I, I, I just looked like, I just looked like a, like a, like a sweaty, vagrant man, baby. And then I, then they scan my ticket and they're like, this ticket's already been used, this, mm. you know? And I'm like, what? and then, so rather than like deal with this rationally, I just started screaming at the, yeah. the, the ticket guy. And then the manager came and I started screaming at him and I sat down and I started sobbing, screaming, fuck me, fuck me with, you know, and, <laughs> I was going in, you know, and I was like, I was going insane. And then like, before I knew it, there was a phalanx of security guards surrounding me <laughs> and escorting yeah. me into the parking lot. If I, you know, I'll, if I hadn't been white, I'm sure I would have gone to jail. Yeah. You know? yeah. Let's face it. Yeah. And then I wandered the grounds of Dodger Stadium sobbing and screaming. You know? People were, like, take, hiding their children from me. Oh. <laughs> and I, you know, I was, and I looked at myself in the – I looked at myself in the um, – mirror of some like a like you know the side mirror of a truck and i like i saw like this you know exhausted sobbing stoned loser you know i was like yeah. i was like what in the name of god has happened to me right now i got into the game i just i eventually someone <laughs> i was bitching about it on social media and eventually someone was like neil Stop being a baby and just call the ticket company. And then I called the ticket company and I sobbed to them. And I was like, my mother died. Mm -hmm. She always wanted to go to the World Series. My mother hated baseball. Yeah, right, right. She never have gone to the World Series with me. But I, I played that card. And then I ended up getting a really good seat. And I got in. And I, like addicts usually do or often mm -hmm. do, I weaseled my way into what I want. <laughs> real, real good at that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the special. That's, that's like a special characteristic of of a successful addict is that like your ego is so large anyway mm -hmm. so it's not the day i quit i i, I kind of like kept puffing off the vape pen for a few weeks after that but like three weeks or so after that i just like i, I gave it up you know i was just like i was like yeah. I, I was like i i got i got to turn my life around before it's too late well you know, there's actually the next question that came in just leads what you said leads right into that. So when I asked, uh, how have you dealt with your marijuana addiction? Did you get uh, professional help? Uh, well, I did. I have a therapist. You know, I finally started seeing a therapist to deal with um, 
compulsive behaviors, you know, mm -hmm. um, ma marijuana is, it was the sort of the enabling substance, but it, right. it, it a whole, um, you know, a whole raft of, you know, when you're yes. an addict, like you just do a bunch, you do a lot of bad shit, stupid shit. So I, I, I so I, 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 yeah, so I, I, I have a therapist who I work with, um, at this point, it's more of a standard therapist patient relationship. I feel like I'm like, mm -hmm. not, you're never recovered, but I'm like, I'm fairly solid in recovery. And then I also went to Marijuana Anonymous. Oh, yeah. Okay, and great. I I, and I and I worked, I worked uh, and, and continue to work the 12 steps of the anonymous organizations. Um, and, you know, they have their pluses in mind. You know, the anonymous groups are like, are great. They are great because, especially because you get to, you have a community of other people who are in no position to judge you. They're not allowed to judge you. And they have the same problems that you do or similar problems to the ones you mm -hmm. have. Um, this community is fairly small in Austin. I, I went to a, um, I went to an event in, uh, in, LA and it was that community is enormous. The marijuana. Yes. Community. I was like, I went to the meeting in West Hollywood on a Friday night. And I was like, this is happening stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm like, wow. This is wild. But it's not like that here. It's a little, 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 little more subdued, but that's okay. I mean, I, 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 I just, you know, and so I, then I, you know, got a sponsor who was fairly hard on me and, um, I, cause I, I required a little tough love and just kind of cracked the whip and, made me you know i did a first step and the first step is just like a full confession of all your sins um and which which we did i did publicly um in front of a group and you know and the book in some ways has a first step like quality to it yes. but it was, but i went but there was even more in what i in what i did before the group uh, anonymously um, and then, you know, and then you were, and then, then there's other stuff you got to like, basically like you have to establish your spiritual foundation for your life. And, you know, I practice yoga. I have like a fairly, that was, that was, that stuff's actually been fairly easy for me because I understand, because I have a, I've experienced the idea of something bigger than myself. So I was able to plug that in. And then, then you got to make a list of your character flaws. You know, the drill. And you yeah. gotta like, and you gotta like write down all the shitty things you did to all the people that you did them to, and why yeah, yeah. you did them, and what you know, what you know. It's like okay, my dad was mean to me, but he, I was also mean to him, and this was my problem, and 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 you go have to go way back, and you have to go real deep, and then eventually you got to start calling and emailing people who you've wronged, mm -hmm. and that sucks. Yes. But I did it, and I continue to do it occasionally if something comes up. And you have to constantly be making new amends to people. Like I had a friend of me, like, just to, you know, right when this pandemic started, we were on the phone. He's like, you know, Neil, you're a real asshole to me. I'm like, I, I can't wait. I'm on lockdown here. <laughs> Come on. You want me to deal with this now? But I did. I had to deal with it. Like, you have to be if, – if someone's pissed at you, if someone has demands that you – fess up then you kind of just have to you know eat crow and do it so it's this mm -hmm. constant process of like reevaluating who you are and how you are in relation to other people you just got to basically take a long hard look at yourself and i don't know i mean I, I i i did do that and i continue to do that and that's just and that's that's how you you know that's how you recover from addiction because with marijuana it didn't take long to get it out of my body. Right. You know, it was like a few days. I was kind of grumpy. <laughs> you know, I was like, the fog had to blow away. <laughs> you know? So it wasn't the, you know, I was a little, I, I, I sweated for a couple of evenings. But then it was pretty much gone physically. And then I had to, then you have to deal with the wreckage of your life. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'll make sure we get to this part of the book that I really loved. I don't know a really good segue for it. Uh, so we want to have one, but, uh, it just discontinued uh, the segue by the way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> uh, I, 
I was really impressed by all the uh, Jeopardy stories. You're mm. a Jeopardy champion. Correct. That's a specific thing. Like there's, it's it's a certain group of of it's an elite group of company that can call themselves that. Like it's not just a smart guy or whatever. Uh, you know, you're a Jeopardy champion. Uh, three, so three times, three. I won three games. Yeah, you know, it's funny because like in my my social circle is largely these days comprised of Jeopardy champions and contestants because I still play. <laughs> Well, I still play pub trivia, and in order yeah. to be on my team, you had to have appeared on Jeopardy. And wow. and like I know, there's a whole online trivia community, <laughs> very, and like all the Jeopardy people know one another. So, yeah. oh wow, yeah, and so like the secret my, society. It's not. It's, it's not. It's, it's not. It's not secret. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just. It's just not. Oh, it's not like not everyone belongs to it. <laughs> yes. Um. You know, we're prof- this, these are these are like we're like professional baseball players. You know, we were like the ones who made money playing the game we love. So, um, yeah. So, so to my mind, like, okay, yeah, I won like sixty something thousand dollars playing Jeopardy. That puts me maybe in the top seven hundred and fifty players of all time, which is great. But if you look at a list of like the top seven hundred and fifty NBA players of all time. By the time you get down to the 700s, you're like, oh, Kevin Duckworth. <laughs> okay. You know, he yeah, played. Oliver Miller. Yeah, sure. <laughs> exactly. Like the big O. I'm like the big O of Jeopardy. <laughs> you know, so he played for the, yeah, so that's actually a name. I, you know, or if you look, even baseball, which has more players than basketball, if you look at the mm-hmm. top 750 home run hitters, by the time you get to 750, you're looking at guys who hit 230 homers, and you're like, ah, they had some good seasons for the Brewers or whatever. Um, anyway, oh, yeah. so yeah, so it's don't get me wrong, it's awesome, and I love being on it. And 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 the important thing about Jeopardy too is that I was sober when I was on it. I actually quit weed for two or three months after I got cast. I don't remember exactly. It was, it was a short period, but I went into the dojo. I, I was like doing yoga two hours a day and I was <laughs> meditating and I was doing push-ups, and I, I stopped eating tortilla chips. I lost 10 pounds and, and I was like studying. I was like, I was like, you know, there, there's, a, there's a website where you can like, they have all the Jeopardy clues archived since 1984. And I was just drilling down and I was like reading like studying lists of like Shakespeare quotes and like birthstones and, you know, fill in the gaps as best I could. <clears throat> there were some categories where I knew I was fine and I went for it, you know, and I, and I achieved the goal. And then the second I was done, I, I was, well, I went out to, to dinner with my parents. And then as soon as that was over, I went over to a friend's house and I got hot. <laughs> and I went right. back to the hotel where I was staying and I, I stuffed the, towel under the door smoked a joint on the toilet took it took a crap and and sobbed <laughs> sounds like a winner yeah um okay we got some more questions coming in here um oh. uh, uh what is uh, a really a really good existential question for for any for any writer why did you write your book hmm. You want to answer that, Buggy? Yeah, I don't know, <laughs> man. The book. I guess it's because they paid you. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. That's, the, that's also the reason I wrote it. Um, you know, I, I initially started writing the book after my mother died. And the initial con, I wanted, I needed it to sort of, I needed to process that experience. Um. And so that was the initial goal was to like write a book about overcoming grief by becoming a professional poker player. (laughs) I I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get very far. I did manage like to transcend the, um, I managed to get past the chicken wing bar and, and managed to graduate to like local card rooms and home games. I got to the next level of, of, anyway, that was the initial idea. I, I wrote a proposal, maybe even like, I think I actually wrote an entire manuscript and submitted it around and every, every, everyone on earth rejected. I was still getting high at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I don't know. I mean, 
and then after I quit marijuana, it just kind of occurred to me that there might be other people out there who have a similar situation, or maybe don't have the exact same life circumstances as me, but who like are in a similar situation where like, you know, marijuana just kind of snuck up on them, you know? And there's not a lot of literature out there for people who have a weed addiction or who, you know, if you were addicted to anything else, there, you know, pills or booze or crack or I, I, cocaine, I don't know, or heroin. Like there's all there's there's ample literature, whereas most of the literature and fiction and, and video depictions of marijuana is of something that's kind of cute and funny. Yeah. And so I don't know. I felt I wrote a piece in the New York Times. So we're, we're um, and and that's not the piece that got that guy fired. From the editorial. <laughs> well, I did I did email him about that initially, but I, I, that may have been the first straw um, that led to his demise. But yeah, and then I wrote that piece, and then you know, I never really trust it when people are like, you know, when they're always like, I received thousands of responses, and the response was so overwhelming, and I was just mm-hmm. I broke my heart. I was like, that's not what happened. You know, I got a yeah over the course of a few months, got a few dozen emails. Facebook messages, whatever, maybe not even a few dozen, maybe like three dozen. And, um, you know, but, but, and some of them were for people I knew. And then some of them were just from random stoners in small towns who were like, I read your piece and, you know, you really spoke, you, you told my story. And no one has ever told me ever that I've told their story. Wow. Okay. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe when I was writing about yoga a little bit, but it's not the same, you know, and I was like, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I actually had, I tapped into something, maybe it's not like a major thing, but like, and so then I was like, well, maybe there's a, there's a book length version of this. So I, I, you know, I just turned it into a pitch and then uh, Central Recovery Press bought it and hired you to, yes. uh, to midwife it into the world. and. <laughs> And I'm, you know, and, and you, you, uh, you made it better. And then, you. you know, and then, and then they released it during a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Typical. Yeah. Time we can't, yeah. Typical. yeah. <laughs> Just great, greatest time to, to release a, a piece of art for sure. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've got another question here. Uh, it says, how long have you been off pot? Mm. Almost three years. Nice. It'll be, it'll be three years in November. It'll leave November 11th. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see where the world's at on November 11th. <laughs> that'll be a awesome. week. That'll be a week after election day. Um, one of the other things I that was really strong in your book is just uh, your you talk a lot about your 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 uh, really close relationships. Uh, most of your your family, uh, just the relationships between you know siblings and 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 uh, you know uh, your, your mom and, and your dad were both really big in the book, and then also your wife and your son. I don't know if you uh-huh. care to talk about those relationships and uh, both pre and post marijuana use. Sure. Um, well, unfortunately, there was no relationship with my mother post marijuana use. You know, she was. Cl- yeah. she- she, she, my parents didn't like my pot use. They were they were very worried about it, especially as it as it ramped up. Um, yes. And uh, they, they never said anything. And in fact, even once it legalized in Colorado, even tried it a couple of times because you know I had some relatives who lived up there, and they, you know, they they my mom even went to a pot store with me. God bless Aww. her. I know, very, <laughs> very sweet. She's she's was, she was a wonderful woman. Um, and she indulged maybe sometimes maybe too much indulged me um you know my father uh my relationship with him before well i was smoking you know my relationship with him has always been a bit bit rocky um i mean we never were estranged uh and we we were i wouldn't say we were distant from each other too like i think we knew each other pretty well we just weren't real compatible um but after, you know, but he was very sick. He was very sick when one part of the reason my mother's um, death was so horrible is that he was actually in a coma with uh, some kind of unrelated problem unrelated to hers when she passed. So I didn't have, my sisters and I didn't have a parent to help us through 
the death of the other parent. He came out of that, and then we had to tell him that his wife had died while he'd been unconscious. But, you know, he... Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was horrible. Um, and then he lived another year and a half or so after that, maybe a little, little, almost two years, but in very poor health and constantly declining. And it was very, uh, he wanted to live. His body just wouldn't let him. Um, and so it was very dramatic almost. And, but, you know, and I was on drugs for the first few months after mom died. And then I sobered up eight months later or so. And that's when he started to really go downhill. And part of my sobriety process was helping my sisters take care of him. You know, it's, I, I, I would go to Phoenix a lot. I, that's where my parents live was in Arizona. It's where I grew up. And I'd go to Phoenix and I would just like stay with him for three or four weeks and just like, and it was awful. I mean, I was taking him to the, you know, he was, he was just a physical and, a, and mental wreck. And I was hauling him to these doctor's appointments and he wasn't listening to the doctors. He was clearly dying. Mm -hmm. um, even though none of us were allowed to say that. And, uh, you know, and it was, it was just, you know, and we, we, it's not like we were having these heartfelt conversations either. That's not really what he did um, with me. So, uh, but the fact that I was sober allowed me to take care of him and focus on his needs more than mine. Like my needs were not that important at that point. Like he needed my help and my sit, and even though he wouldn't admit it, more importantly, my sisters needed my help because they lived closer to him, but needed a break, you know, and needed, the, I was their, I'm their big brother and they needed me to support them. So it allowed me being sober, allowed me to um, kind of just man up. Mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. yes so, and i uh, ha have they said anything different about your your personality like on and off or like yeah or, yeah or they both like now said, they both said you're like a different person mm -hmm. i'm like well i'm really more i'm really like a more mature version of the person i was before i started smoking weed <laughs> like i yeah. felt like i was a decent person like when i was a teenager i had i had yes. you know usual teenager imbalances but and in college i was like felt like i was a decent good-hearted person and then gradually I, and then even in my 20s but then gradually the weed kind of took over and i became an, an asshole uh, <laughs> gradually and i was like i was like i was thinking like people were calling me an asshole i'm like but i'm i think at my core though i don't think i am right no right. i think like, i think at my core i'm actually decent um, but I, my my behavior wasn't showing that, and so um, yeah, so I I think they both they both have said that. I mean, whatever. I'm going to take that with a grain of salt, um, because that's just my ego talking. Like, oh, I'm a good person now. Look at me. Mm -hmm. I took care of my dad when he was dying. Give me a freaking medal, you know. <laughs> I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't a jerk to my sisters when my dad was dying. Hooray for me. You know, I finally like, res you know, give my wife the full love and respect that she deserves. Hey, look at me, you know, someone, someone give me a presidential medal of freedom. But, you know, and right. it, so, you know, I don't, it, so my book is more about my relationship with my extended family. You know, the stuff I was, a, I was definitely like not as, as strong a presence in my, in my, for my wife and my son as I could have been either. You know, I, mm -hmm. I was, I was off on my, on my hipster adventures doing all mm -hmm. kinds of shit. And, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't there for them. Like, I mean, I, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I've been a neglectful father. I, I, I that's just not, that's not how I characterize myself, but I, I've been like inconsistent, you know? And I think that since um, I sobered up, I've been consistent. I've been a consistent husband. I've been a more consistent father. And during the pandemic, which has been a tough time for everyone, I've been more reliable presence in the house. And I've definitely been a presence in the house because I can't freaking go anywhere else. <laughs> but it's allowed me to be, you know, I can't even imagine what this would have been like if I'd been baked the whole time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the paranoia can get bad enough, 
you know, when I've had some, I've had my share of like sleepless nights of apocalyptic meanderings in my mind. Um, but I've been sober. So, yeah, so that's, so yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's been helpful. Nice. Uh, I have another question coming in here. Um, it says, uh, is it possible you or others have uh, addictive personality? Uh, I'll know, like, yeah, this is a, a term, addic- addictive personalities. Uh, I prefer addictive physiologies, uh, but I don't know if you have any opinions on that, uh, on addictive personalities. or. Yeah, I mean, the, I don't know. I, I see what you're saying. Like, there is definitely a history of alcoholism in my family. You know, addiction is a disease. Yes. It is a genetic disease that people saw many, many people suffer from. Um, sometimes I feel, I feel like with some substances, sometimes you like, if you're on, if you are in pain and you're on painkillers then you end up just becoming addicted to the painkiller, that's different than what happened to me and probably than what happened to you. Mm Um, I don't even know what an addictive personality is. I had a um, narcissistic person. I have a narcissistic personality. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of personality is prone to addictive behaviors because they believe the world revolves around them and their needs. Yes. And so whatever I felt like doing at the moment, I just did because it was all about me. Right. Nice. Thank you. Um, another, uh, another question I think is, probably answer this pretty quickly uh but it says does the book discuss research on marijuana or just your story yeah it's not a this is not a scientific text Mm -hmm. i'm not great at that kind of reporting anytime i try to do that kind of reporting it always ends up um feeling pretty slim so no there's no there's very little science in fact i would say there's actually no science it is science free it is very much yeah, this is very much a memoir. It's a personal book. story. It's like it's like a movie. <laughs> yeah, there's nice. no if you're looking for some sort of de- definitive. If you're looking for like a rational proof that this is addictive, this is not the book. Uh, this is a this is an, an 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 entertainment. Let's let's say that right. Yeah, and right. there's no there's not a lot of politics in it either. I mean, I do. I am I am not against legalization but I don't go into the, but I don't go into a lot of the politics of, of 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 marijuana and marijuana reform there's a lot of writers who can do that better than I can Nice uh another question coming in here uh it's a little open to interpretation uh do you think people don't take marijuana seriously Hmm Yeah that's actually an interesting question <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look at how marijuana is depicted in popular culture. Who 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 are the famous stoners in, in, in pop culture? Snoop Dogg. No one takes Snoop Dogg seriously. Seth Rogen. He doesn't take it seriously. Pineapple Express. I I, I hated that movie even when I was a stoner. <laughs> I was like, this is just I mean, the so much guns, so many guns in that movie, so much violence. You know. Yeah, and it's like Willie Nelson just like getting high. Isn't Willie the best just because he's stoned all the time? And I'm like, well, you know, there are other, maybe other reasons to like Willie Nelson, you know? So like, yeah, so like the, the so the people who, the marijuana is depicted ca- casually like smoking was in the 50s, you know? Mm-hmm. It's just this this funny thing. And like, you know how it is, like, I don't know, like, on this episode of let's say Grace and Frankie, Grace and Frankie get uh, eat an edible and mm-hmm. have a wacky adventure at the beach or whatever. You know, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, there, every sitcom has this thing, and there never appear to be any consequences. Even alcohol has a worse. Even alcohol has a worse reputation, and you see people casually drinking everywhere in TV and movies. Um, but I don't know, like. The Lost Weekend, how, that was almost 100 years ago that movie came out. It was like eight <laughs> years ago, you know? Days of Wine and Roses. I mean, I don't know if you know that movie or not. That, that Jack Oh, Black. yeah. That's a great, great freaking movie. But, you know, it was 60 years ago. 
Mm-hmm. Marijuana, it's just like Seth Rogen, you know, punk, having a joint and getting high and watching cats and riffing on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I, that really is that really is true. I mean, like I, I mentioned at the, at the opening of the conversation, uh, you know, the, the earliest depiction I know of, of of marijuana in movies was in Reefer Madness. Uh, which was sure. in the 1930s. That was a and, long, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, like over, over 80 years ago. And uh, 80 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, oh, uh, just to actually start getting to wrap this up. First of all, is there anything else you want to say about the book that we didn't bring up? Or is there any part that you wanted to talk about that, that we didn't mention? No. Actually, I think we covered a lot of it. I don't want to give everything away. I want people to buy the damn thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, Obviously, it doesn't end with my death. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No spoilers. Um, yeah. Well, I guess I guess maybe to 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 wrap things up, uh, talk about like uh, uh, about maybe uh, any, anything in your life going forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything you're up to now. Uh, what you're, you know, I mean, I know we're all locked down, but I don't know if you want to mention just anything about your creative process or, uh, or just maybe just like, you know, creative process of being a writer during lockdown or just kind of, you know, um, just yes. the next steps you're taking. I do have a project I wish to plug. Uh, I'm not, my writing during lockdown has been, I haven't really done, you know, any like serious writing. I've written a few humor pieces and, um, wacky Facebook posts. Uh, but I, I, I am right now, like my fo- big focus is I'm the editor in chief of a, uh, a website called book and film globe. And it's like, a, it's like a pop, it's a pop culture website. We cover issues in, um, we cover the book industry, the film industry, streaming TV, it's reviews. And then lately, you know, since during the COVID era, and then after sort of the social unrest started after the George, Flo- George Floyd killing we've been covering um, the culture war that's erupted. Nice. Uh, Yeah. There's been all kinds of like interesting, like sort of side stories that have happened in publishing and in, and in film industry. And then, you know, there was a, the desecration of the uh, Miguel de Cervantes statue in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Oh yes. That was, that was, I found that appalling. Uh, My mother was a Cervantes enthusiast and scholar and I was, took that very personally. And so, you know, so, so we've sort of carved out a little niche for ourselves. You know, we still write reviews and, and you know, listicles about streaming TV or whatever, but, I, but I, we, we've adopted this sort of semi-news profile covering this, this burgeoning culture war, which is uh, quite fascinating. So I've been, I've been like really focused on that and I do some writing for that, but I also edit a lot of other writers and that's been really gratifying to me to sort of, you know, give other people a voice and we're able to pay them a little bit. And some of them are oh, writers. Sure. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Book and film globe. And I encourage you all to check it out. It's, it, it's, I'm very proud of it. Wow. Thank you, Neil. Okay, everybody. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's program. Oh, uh, excuse me. Think- that's not COVID. <laughs> it's not COVID. It's just a sneeze. It's okay. I don't have a fever. It's okay. Right. I'm okay. Uh, I'm infectious. I want to thank Neil for being here tonight. I'm Bucky Sinister, and this virtual Commonwealth Club program is adjourned.